just a quick bit on the whole, can you guys hear me in the back? Can you guys hear me in the back? All right, can we get started? Okay. Good afternoon. Welcome, everybody. My name is Fadel Kaboob. I teach economics here at Denison University, and I'm the president of the Benzaga Institute for Sustainable Prosperity. It's my pleasure to welcome you to our inaugural conference uh, here at Denison. <laughs> wanted to start with uh, a few introductions, a uh, few thanks, and a um, couple of words about the conference and the theme and what we're trying to uh, accomplish with, with the institute and the research program that, we're, that we've embarked on. Um, I want to start with, with a few thank yous because this event uh, has been a, quite a bit of a logistical uh, enterprise and it couldn't have been accomplished without uh, a large number of people who work behind the scenes to make it happen. And they're still working behind the scenes and in front of the scenes and they're all over. Um, so I'm gonna start with uh, the students who help with uh, a lot of the logistics. Uh, my students here at Denison, Philip, uh, Brenda, James, Logan, uh, Daniel, um, you've seen them everywhere uh, and uh, they've, they've done a fantastic amount of work uh, with the program, and thank you. <laughs> um, I want to thank uh, Matt Forstatter, my teacher, my friend, my mentor, and research director at the Benzaga Institute, so thank you for all your support. <laughs> uh, the speakers, of course, uh, you'll, you'll hear from them uh, in a little bit, and tomorrow, uh, they're a fantastic group of people. Um, they're very engaged, they're very uh, serious about the work they do, and we're just uh, thrilled to have them here, thrilled to have them as part of the institute team. Um, they've, the people had to switch their schedules to get here. They really wanted to be here to, to be with us, uh, so thank you, uh, everybody. Um, I want to thank uh, Lori McKenzie Crane for doing all the uh, graphic design that you see all over the place here. She's done a fantastic work with her team. Uh, the PR team here at Denison and University Communications, uh, they've done uh, a lot of work to help us with uh, publicity. And um, of course, we can't have this live stream happening as we speak without Cheryl and Joseph and the team from uh, Denison's ITS uh, services. So thank, thank you very much for, uh, for all the tech support. Last but not least, I want to thank uh, Saeed Mustafa here with us today, uh, the founder of the Institute for his support uh, to this venture uh, over the last year, for believing in our mission and for supporting us with, uh, with uh, financial resources, logistical resources, and with uh, kind of the, the message that we're trying to, to send out uh, to, to the world. Uh, so thank you. Our co-sponsors are the economics departments uh, here at Denison, so thank you very much for your co-sponsorship. And also um, Denison's uh, president, uh, President Adam Weinberg, for his uh, support. He couldn't be here with us. He's, he's on university business somewhere out of town. Um, and I want to thank Kim Copeland, uh, provost here at Denison, for all of her support for the institute and the kind of work we're, we're doing. I don't want to forget anybody, so uh, I know that we're going to have a lot of people, uh, a handful of people, uh, tweeting and doing Facebook social media stuff, uh, starting with uh, Akdash uh, and Logan uh, sitting in the back there. Thank you very much for doing that. But I also know many of you are on Twitter, so uh, Rohan and Kot and Pavlina and others will probably be tweeting. So use the hashtag and we'll follow you and and we'll be taking questions live. So those of you who are watching the live stream, um, use the hashtag, uh, use Twitter, use Facebook, and uh, um, our social media team will, will field those questions uh, to the speakers um, and we'll, uh, we'll be responding. Now, in terms of the, the content of the conference and what we're trying to do at the Institute, um, very simple message. 
really was with us from the beginning uh, as a group of uh, economists, political economists, people interested in public policy, people interested in real change that affects quality of life for the average person around the world, uh, people interested in alternative ways of doing community development, alternative ways of doing public policy. Um, we got together and put together this mission statement. Uh, we invited a number of people, many of whom are here today, to join us in this uh, program. And the message is, is very simple. The mainstream of the profession, the mainstream of public policy is in a dead end corner at this point. We hear the messages again and again that we can't afford better schools, we can't afford housing the homeless, we can't afford you know, better quality infrastructure, we can't afford, you know, all of these things are great, but we can't afford them. Um, even our friends on the environmentalist you know, side of, the, of things, they say, yeah, we'd, we'd like to do all of these great things, but it's like too expensive, we can't afford it. Governments are broke. Look at Europe, look at Greece, look at the US Congress, look at the national debt. So this is the mainstream of the profession. And what we have to offer here at the Benzaga Institute and many of our friends here is that we have an alternative way of looking at government finances, of looking at public finance. Um, sovereign governments can always afford anything that is producible, that is technologically feasible, it can always be afforded by sovereign governments, sovereign nations. The story is different, as we'll discuss uh, over the next few sessions. The story is different for individual households, for individual states, the state of Ohio, the state of New York. They're not sovereigns. They can't issue their own currency. So the, the, the rules of financial sovereignty don't apply to individual states, to companies, to individual uh, families but they do apply to sovereign states who control their own sovereign currency. So this is really the, the central focus. And once we establish the fact that sovereign states can, af sovereign governments can afford anything they want essentially and can manage their finances accordingly and can manage public policy accordingly, then the sky is the limit. Then it's up to human ingenuity, technological innovation, it's up to what participatory democracy produces in terms of priorities that we need to focus on. And that's what we want to showcase in this conference, uh, that there are different ways of doing economic development, different ways of achieving prosperity for all, different ways of reducing inequality, uh, both domestically and internationally, and that they're affordable. And that's the central message. And with that, I wanna thank you again for being here. And I wanna introduce Tim Copeland, Provost at Denison University. Well, before I welcome you, I would just like to suggest that we all thank Fadl for all of his work to organize this conference. On behalf of, of the college, and on behalf of Denison, it's my pleasure to welcome you to our campus and to our community. Um, I feel like I'm part of history, and it really is an honor to be here to launch, to help launch this inaugural conference hosted by the Gonzaga Institute. Um, it's exciting for me to know that over the next day and a half, there will be 75 to 80 people here, faculty, other scholars, students, um, to discuss these timely and relevant topics related to prosperity. Um, when Fadl came to me, I was going back through my emails to figure out when you first approached me about this. I think it was in May of 2014, which wasn't really very long ago if you think about where the Institute is now. But he approached me about Denison being one of the host sites for the Institute. I, of course, had questions. That's the responsibility of the provost to think through all the questions. But I did take the idea um, pretty quickly to our president, Adam Weinberg. Um, he was, of course, incredibly excited, as was I, about the opportunities that this relationship would provide for Denison and for our students. Um, we're in strategic planning mode here at Denison right now. If you talk to anybody on campus, we'll give you an update on what our strategic priorities are because we've talked about them a lot. But one of those priorities is to infuse global experiences more thoroughly throughout our curriculum and throughout our educational experiences for our students. This institute, this relationship between Denison and the Benzager Institute is just a wonderful opportunity for 
us to bring the world to Denison and for us to help take Denison to the world. And so I'm really pleased that we're able to host this conference, that we're able to support the Institute. And I'm pleased that the Institute has you know, decided to make Denison one of, its, one of its home. So I do know that you're poised for a very intellectually engaging conference. I hope you enjoy your time at Denison. I apologize that there are raindrops falling and that it's not a beautiful Ohio fall day. Maybe there's hope for tomorrow. I haven't looked at the weather forecast. Um, but I, I do hope you enjoy your stay. I know there are many, many people on campus who are willing to, to help you if you have questions and need direction. And But most of all, just um, enjoy your time and really um, know that you're tackling topics that are very, very important. So thank you all. Thank you, Kim. And with that, I'd like to introduce uh, Saeed Benzaga. Thank you very much. Uh, I come from a, uh, a family business that was established in 1881. Uh, we have over 6,000 people working for us. Uh, in uh, 2008, I noticed something. I noticed that the people working for us were struggling to make ends meet. And at the same time, I noticed that our wealth was uh, was dramatically growing a lot faster than it did before. Uh, my father's an economist and uh, board member in the Saudi Central Bank. So I went to him and I said, Dad, could you please explain to me what is going on? He looked at me funny and, and he said, why are you complaining? I said, I'm not complaining. I just want to understand. And he said, well, uh, if, if people work really, really hard, they can achieve what they want in life. I said, but dad, okay, great, but these people are working hard. Uh, and, and, and I'm not talking about people without jobs. I'm talking about the people working inside of our organizations who I've been working with side by side for the past 20 years. I know them. I know their families and they're struggling. I want to understand why. Why are they struggling? So he gave me a long list of, of people. These people are, are his, his friends. These people all have been working for the past 50, 60 years, and they've built empires. These people understand business and understand the world. So, so I went to every single one of them, and every single one of them gave me the exact same story. He told me, this is the way the world is. Well, it didn't fit with me. It didn't feel right. Uh, so. So I took the decision to turn to the uh, so-called science of economics. And I turned on the internet and I said, I'm going to find a book. And I went all the way back to uh, Adam Smith and I started reading. Um, and, and my source for books is a site called Amazon. Um, and the very first wave of books that you get, uh, they all led me to Milton Friedman. And, and, and slowly, I began to convince myself that, that, that these people are right. This is, I mean, all these really smart people, they they're all saying the exact same thing. In fact, I went further than that. I began uh, reading Ayn Rand. <laughs> and in, in my backpack, I carried a book called uh, uh, Capitalism, the uh, I'm something like you, the I'm... Uh, the misunderstood or so anyway i i forget the title but that book was was my my bible i said this is this is it that and the virtue of uh, selfishness these these two books i took them i bought them i i gave them to my friends my family and i said i found it this is it this is the reason why people are uh, are uh, are uh, struggling is because we have too much government just get rid of the government let's say fair and, and, and life will be rosy. Well, on YouTube, I search for videos, uh, and, and, and I stick in phrases like uh, Friedman, Friedman versus Hayek. Um, on one of the searches, there was a video all the way down of, of some guy, I, I don't know, being interviewed by some guy who looked weird. So I ignored it once, twice. The third day, 
third day I was bored, so I said, okay, I will click that video. That video, uh, that video was an interview with uh, Warren Mosley. So it starts off normal, your name, where you come from, what state, you know, what you want to do, and so on, so on. It was, was boring, and I was about to turn it off. But then the guy asked him a question, and the question was about the budget, about, about you know, the deficit. And he changed his face, he, he, you know, he, he, he sat up and, and, and said, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. And he started talking about taxes. And he, and he gave his, his example, you know, when you go to pay your taxes and, and you've got a bunch of money and you go up to the window and you give them the cash and they give you a, s a slip that thanks you, you know, for your efforts, for, for your contribution, you know, the war in Iraq, they shred the money. And I had to pause that because it made no sense to me. What? What do you mean they, they shred the money? There's no way. That's, that's the way that you fund government. You get your taxes, then you spend it. So I played that video over and over again for the next 30 minutes. And I could feel my brain being rewired because it made sense. I tried to find fault in this very simple statement. I could not. So I Googled Warren Mosler. And, and I got that guy right there, uh, uh, Professor Ray. And, uh, and, and I ordered his book. I got the book, and I read the book. I read the book again, and I read the book again. And, and I couldn't find it, a single fault in it. It was incredible. So, so I purchased a uh, hard copy of the book, and I gave it as a gift to the head of the central bank in Saudi. And I'm told now there's two or three people from the central bank in, uh, uh, you know, UMKC. Um, uh, one of our employees walked into my office. He's, he's, he's actually a friend of the family. And, and he saw this book on the table. And he picked it up and he said, Said, what are you reading now? I said, uh, this, 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 this book proves that everything we know about about uh, British economics is completely wrong, and I urge you to 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 you know read it. It's it's really really important. And uh, the the author uh, is associated with UMKC, and he and he jumped up and he said, "My daughter-in-law is is there working on her PhD." I said, "Really? Could you please speak to her? I I I would like to meet these people." And one year later, we're here now. It's, it's been a very interesting year for me, um, and um, it's very difficult for a person to, to switch from, a, from, a, from, an, from an ide ideological stance. I was, an, I was a libertarian in thought. I went all the way that, that way. And in a span of three months, I turned around and I went back all the way the other way, <laughs> which, is, which is very, very, very difficult. And I learned that because talking to, to people, no one I've talked to will, 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 will change their stance that quickly. Um, and I'm on the chamber in Jeddah. I'm the consul general of, of uh, Finland in uh, Jeddah. And I get to meet a lot of interesting people. These uh, people are from here in the States, from the State Department, from, from Commerce, from the White House, I get, uh, and the people on the top, they they all agree. They say yes, Said, we understand this, makes sense. Now go away. <laughs> when I speak to the people who work inside of the departments, they have no idea what I'm talking about. Uh, it's 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 they're clueless completely. And I think one must win battle is to engage the, the, the employees of the public and the private sector in this country. The people on top will not move if the people who work inside of, uh, you know, their, their, their team isn't aware. I don't know the way. I don't know, I, I, I don't know the way to engage the employees of, of the Treasury Department or the employees of the Commerce Department. I can't get to them. And I don't know how you would. I'm, you know, I'm sure you can find a way, but I can't. I can only speak to the boss, and the boss has no interest to drive this. So I guess this is my way, uh, in a way that I can, uh, contribute to uh, 
my belief that we ha- there is no reason for poverty to continue and, and uh, grow. And jobs are the answer. I think every person has something to contribute. Every person that wants to contribute should be able to contribute and should be able to, to do so uh, in a dignified way. Thank you very much. Thank you, Saeed. Um, we have uh, a couple of minutes before we start the, the panel. Matt, if you can give me just one, oh, yes, one yes, second. Yes, yes. Um, I wanted to uh, thank Saeed again and thank Kim Copeland uh, for their remarks. And I wanted to add um, one more thing to the, the statement that I said about uh, the Institute and what we believe in, and, and Saeed just reiterated it, which is, we believe that we can afford full employment. We believe that we can afford um, decent quality of life for all citizens, not for you know the select segment of society. Um, and something has been on my mind, and I suppose on, on everybody's minds and ev- everywhere in the news over the last uh, several weeks uh, in Europe, uh, in the Middle East, uh, the, the refugees who are trying to find a new home, a safe home for their families, um, crossing oceans, dying uh, on the way, and then in some cases being greeted by armed guards telling them you can't afford to have a home. Uh, That's just unbelievable to me and to many of us in this room uh, to say that we can't afford to provide housing. We can't afford to provide a safe place to live, uh, a safe school system uh, for refugees, uh, not just Syrian refugees, but refugees from all over the world. Um, so with that, uh, with, uh, with your uh, permission, I'd like to uh, take a, a few seconds and a, a moment of silence, uh, of silence to, um, for the refugees uh, from Syria, for people who um, struggle all over the world.